Amazing things happen whenever grace and faith connect. Champions are born and champions can do what they're designed to do and really make a difference wherever they are in life. And I don't know if you know it or not, but if you have believed in what Jesus has done on a cross and you believe that he has forgiven you of all your misses in life, all of your sin, that's what he did on the cross. He gave his life and our place so that, you know what, that we could have a connection to God because the Bible says sin basically um, uh, disconnects us from God and sin is simply missing the mark of God's amazing standard for your life, God's glorious uh, standard. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of God's amazing standard, his glorious standard. But you know, the Bible says that Jesus came to basically pay the penalty for our miss so that we could be back in a right relationship with God. And once we do that, believe in Jesus and his resurrection, the Bible says we are birthed anew in Christ Jesus. And we are actually amazing champions. We can begin to champion what God has for us to do in this world. We can be who the Creator has designed us to be here on planet Earth. And so I hope to really spur that in us who are believers in Jesus today. I hope to motivate that, encourage that in a very, very powerful way. I want to read a few passages of Scripture today and kind of set up where we're going. Then I want to pray for us. And then I just kind of want to speak to you just a few minutes about using the faith that you have in Jesus, God's grace gift, to really, really powerfully influence those around you in such a way that they respond to the good news of Jesus and become who God has designed them to be, that champion of grace. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, uh, a letter that the church planner Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He wanted to remind them of who they were and it says it this way in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, for it is by grace, and by the way, grace does have a name, and grace's name is Jesus. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved, you have been rescued, you have been salvaged through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that none of us can boast. But something amazing happens when grace and faith intersect. You know, champions are born, and that's really what we strive to do here at Barefoot Church, is to create environments where people can put their faith in the grace gift from God. His name is Jesus. So we try to create environments where grace and faith can intersect and people can catch grace and live out the life that God designs for them to live out. You know, for me, I grew up playing sports, and so I'm an athlete, and, and you know, in my old days, I'm not an athlete anymore, um, but forgive me for using, you know, what sports analogies, it's just who I am, and if I could think of something a little bit different to illustrate this, I would, but I kinda wanna share with you what it really means for grace and and faith to intersect. And this is an illustration that really makes sense to me. It's like, you know, it's like whenever a receiver is on a football team running down the field. And grace is like the football. And whenever that football is caught in the receiver's hands, there's opportunity for the receiver to run and score a touchdown if he knows how to handle the ball that's in his hands. And so you and I, our faith is like the receiver. The grace is like what God launches. And by the way, he throws a perfect pass every time. We just gotta figure out how to get in the open and catch the ball. And once we catch it, there's amazing things that we can do with our life. We can score touchdowns and not only win in our own life, but we can influence the entire community, the entire team and help other people win also. And so grace and faith connect, something amazing happens. Let me show you how it says that once that happens, champions are born. It's in the very next verse. Look what it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, once faith and grace connect, we are God's masterpiece. 
Basically, we are God's champion. It says, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago, so we can put points on the board, so we can score touchdowns. Once that grace is caught by our faith, it gives us the ability to do the amazing things and become a champion that God has created us to be. Is that a beautiful thing or what? Huh? Aren't you glad that God wants you to catch grace and he wants to teach you how to score touchdowns with your life to influence those around you? That's who our great God is. He's an amazing coach. He's an amazing king. And he wants to help us become who he has created us to be. And so what I want to do today is I want to read a story out of Mark chapter 2 where grace and faith connect and then because they connect, what happens is a champion is born. And because of that champion, an entire community is influenced in, a, in a, an amazing, amazing way. And we're going to talk about how to have and exercise this amazing faith today that we can have in God's grace gift, a Jesus, to have incredible influence and, and really begin to deposit some amazing things into our community. This is what the Bible says, Mark chapter 2, in this story, um, verses 1 through 12. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed. Everybody say packed. God loves a packed house. The Bible says that the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While Jesus was preaching God's word to them, four men arriving carried a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. The Bible says, so they dug a hole through the roof above Jesus' head, and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. The Bible says, seeing their faith, everybody say faith. Faith has the ability to really influence in a powerful way. The Bible says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. And the Bible goes on to say, but some of the teachers of the religious law were sitting there and thought to themselves. Some of the people who were good people who had really studied the scriptures, the Bible says that they were there. They were actually had studied the scriptures and they knew all about God but they were there and they had missed God. You know, you can study about God and pack the house and miss God. And the Bible says that when Jesus said, I forgive you of your sins, that these people were conflicted because the God they had studied about, they didn't, they, or they thought that only God could forgive sins, which was true, but they didn't recognize that God was sitting right in front of them in the flesh. And the Bible goes on to say, what is he saying? This is what they said. This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man is God in the flesh and has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go, go home. The Bible says the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. Everybody say stunned. See, the amazing thing is, is when we're touched by God's grace, and we begin to express that in such a way that it has the ability to really stun those who are basically seeking who God is. The Bible says they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. Let's pray. God, we pray today that through this story, in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, where Jesus' grace intersected faith. And it, because, it caused an avalanche in a community that we could embrace some of the truths about faith 
out of this passage and begin to live those out so that the grace is expressed in our community just like it's expressed here in this passage. God, you're an amazing God. We pray for our Easter services. We pray for everybody that's going to be here. We pray for those who aren't here. We pray, God, that you would begin to work in people's heart before us and let us begin to invite, to encourage, to get cards, to really live our faith out in the schools, in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our neighborhoods today by the principles we're going to learn through this story. And God, would you forever change our community because faith and grace intersect and it's lived out loud and changes the community. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap today. And I uh, <clears throat> just want to spend a few moments talking to you today about really how to live your faith in such an encouraging way that really it begins to influence people in such a powerful way. And, you know, there was a lot of good people there at that house that day. They were seeking God. They were searching for God, but they had missed God. But God uses this in such a way that he begins to reveal to them who he is. See, that's what God's desire is, is to reveal to people who he is so that they can have a relationship with him, so they can be forgiven of their sins and have a relationship with him and move forward and become that champion that he has created, created them to be. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about that today. And the Bible says that these guys brought their friend to the feet of Jesus, and he was flat on his back on the mat. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been flat on my back on the mat before in several different circumstances, relational, you know, financial, physically, all kinds of things. You ever met anybody on the mat before, huh? Many of us have been on the mat ourselves, right? How many of you like wrestling? Anybody like wrestling? Nobody? Just me? Dude, I grew up watching yeah, Dr. Gwynn likes wrestling back in the back, so I thought he was fixing to do his Ric Flair. Whoa! You know what I'm saying? So, um, but I used to love growing up watching Saturday afternoon wrestling, okay? And I probably say that funny with my southern dialect. But, but interesting enough, we only had three channels in our house. We only had two for a long time, Channel 6 and Channel 10. I grew up in South Georgia. And if you wanted to change the channel, you would flip it there, but you had to tune in outside with the antenna. So one of us would have to go outside the window and, you know, turn the, the antenna on top of the house. And my brother would be inside. Oh, whoa, 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 a little fuzzy. Go back, back, back. You know what I'm saying? Anybody else grow up like that? Yeah. Finally, we got Channel 13 a few years later. It was amazing. We had three channels, and if you could really turn that antenna just right, you'd catch PBS, and it was fuzzy, but you could see it, you know, and see those guys on public service television. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think that's what it was. Anyway, however, um, we love to watch Saturday afternoon wrestling, and it would come on. Man, my brothers and I, we would, like, in the commercials, we would be practicing the moves in the living room, all that sort of stuff. But my favorite matches were those tag team matches where, you know, Dusty Rhodes was one of my favorite wrestlers, the bionic elbow, you know, and he would team up with some guys sometimes in a tag team match. And, you know, it never failed that the good guys, you know, it's all fake. There's good guys and there's bad guys. But the good guys, the ones you wanted to win, would always lose at the beginning. And then they would be flat on their back on the mat and they would be down for the count. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they would be like on the back, somebody would put a, a crazy move on them, the enemy would, and they would lay down on the mat, and they would be almost out, man. I mean, they would be going into convulsions, you know what I'm saying, and everything. And then the guy off the top rope would come and land his 400 and some odd pound body right on their chest, and it was over, just poof. But their partner was in the corner. And the referee would begin to count, and at the count of three, you were out. And it was always the same way. One, two, and then that guy would just have enough strength and courage <clears throat> to reach his hand out, tip of his fingers, partner would reach over the rope. And while the referee's hand was in the air, ready to go down for number three, they would tag hands. And all of a sudden, Dusty Rhodes 
would come over the rope on the enemy's head with a bionic elbow, free the guy on the mat to go back to the corner and recover, and it was just amazing. I was thinking about that a little bit this week. <laughs> and I wonder how many people are on the mat that we could encourage. Maybe you're here today and you're on the mat. Maybe that's why you can't. But I want you to understand that's what the church is here for, to encourage you just to put your hand out and let the king of the ring, his name is Jesus, Tag your hand, come in over the top rope, and audaciously begin to take the enemy off of you, put his spirit in you to rise you up so that you can become who God has created you to be. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a trouble-free life. But can I tell you something? There is a king, his name is Jesus, and he wants to come into the ring of life and change everything. He did it for me at the age of 32. And there's thousands of people who live life apart from God. Many of them know about God. Many of them have heard all about God. I did growing up as a kid, but I'd never let the king in the ring. And really, you know what? Once I did, my faith become audacious and contagious, and it began to really help other people see that there is a grace gift from God, a gift from God that wants to team up with them to rise them up to be who he has created them to be. So I just want to talk a little bit of how to use that faith to encourage those who are flat on the map to stick out their hands. See, that's what we try to do here at Barefoot Church is create environments where faith and God's grace can intersect. And Jesus said, if you just have a little bit of faith, a mustard seed of faith in his gift that you can begin to do amazing, amazing things. Now, a lot of people receive the grace. They don't know how to run the ball and score touchdowns, but God will teach you all of that on the journey too. And we strive to do that every single weekend here at Barefoot Church. But I want to encourage you as a champion of grace today, to really activate your faith in such a way it begins to influence not only your life, but it begins to influence those around you. And we're going to see God do a great work through our church. So three quick principles about grace and how it intersects, or, or about faith and how it intersects with grace to really make a difference in a, a community. And the first thing I wrote in my journal about this passage of Scripture is faith, a faith that changes the community steps out. Everybody say steps out steps out and it's willing to do what nobody else will do. See, that's what these guys did in the story, isn't it? I mean, nobody else. How many people walked by this guy and never got him to the feet of Jesus? The Bible says the house was packed. It was full of, it was full of people and the, the, they couldn't get in and the guys could have turned around and, and left, but they stepped out and began to try to get their friend to the feet, the feet of Jesus. You see, a faith that steps out believes in what is to come, not in what just is. They believe that there's, there's more to be accomplished in someone's life. And, and I do believe that these guys understood that there was more to be accomplished in their friend's life that was flat on the mat. And so they stepped out and they did something audacious. They did what nobody else would do. And, and I want to show you because they had full confidence in the grace gift. And it was a, the reason they were able to do what, what, they, what nobody else could do. Look what it says here in Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 2. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the Bible says, the people of the days of old, the people in the Old Testament, the Bible says they earned a good reputation a good reputation in their community because they believed God and stepped towards God to do what nobody else would do. I mean, there's all kinds of examples of that throughout the scriptures. And so, you know, I can believe that I want to go to a foreign country 
today and experience something on another continent. However, I can believe it, I can trust it, I can envision it, I can see, you know, me on a surfboard over in the wherever, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and really, really have hope in that. But unless I get up off my couch and order me a plane ticket and, you know, begin to exercise my faith in what I believe, then actually nothing ever happens. So I can hope, but I hope I'll leave you on the couch. And we've been, we've been actually talking about hope for a lot, lot of weeks now. But I, I want to move that hope to action because, see, the thing is, I can hope to go somewhere. But unless I put faith with my hope, then I never get to where I can be. And, and it doesn't really motivate anybody else either. So one of the challenges of church today, a lot of people talk about Jesus. But they don't do anything with the Jesus that they have. And I really want to encourage you to step out and do something with this grace gift, this gift that God lavished and gave his life. The Bible says it's a ransom for people. And this gift is something that we're to share with the world. But a lot of times how we share that gift takes a little risk, doesn't it? And, and it has to be done a little bit different because what happens is people become inoculated to good news. Because they, they believe it's a story of the past versus something that's happening in the present. And I'm here to declare to you today, Jesus is not just an event that happened in the past. He's a resurrected king that lives inside of his people for the present moment and the present day to really do something incredible. And when we, the people of God, step out on the faith about what we believe about Jesus, it begins to transform those around us in a powerful, powerful way. And, you know, you know think about it. That's what the Bible says that the people of old were commended for. They were people of good reputation because they did what nobody else would do. I think about Noah. And God told Noah to build an ark. Told him to build an ark, and it had not rained in any of human history at this particular time. They didn't know what rain was. And God speaks to Noah and says, build an ark because of the earth's wickedness. I'm going to send a flood, and I need you to build an ark, and I need you to put animals, and I need you to put the people on there that will get on there. So Noah starts building an ark. And I can tell you something, it was different. It was different of, than what anybody else was doing in that culture. But it was the right thing. He believed God. He stepped towards it. He had powerful influence because he did what God said to do. The Bible says Abram. God speaks to Abram and says, I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. I'm going I'm to make you a father of many. I'm going to bless your life, Abram, so you can bless of the world. And he says, go to a land I will show you. You. But see, he didn't say, Abram, I'm going to give you all the stuff, and then you can go to the land. He says, go to the land, and then I'm going to bless you. And it's interesting because God says, step out, Abram, do what nobody else will do, and I'm going to do something amazing in and through you that will influence so many. You know the Bible calls Abram the father of our faith? Isn't that amazing? Because he was willing to do what nobody else would do. And so as a church, a lot of times we have to, you know, never change the message, but we have to step out in order to share this gift of grace, position people's faith so that they can catch grace in a powerful way. We have to do some things sometimes that, that nobody else is willing to do. And what happens is we kind of get caught in processes and we don't listen to God and step out and take a step to see a lot of times what he wants us to do, and we wonder, you know, why a community's not changed. And so what we strive to do here is to kind of do some things, try to listen to the voice of God and reach out to the people he wants us to reach out with so their faith can intersect with God's grace gift. And we do it here in weekend services. We, we design services so people can understand and receive the grace gift, and we hope many people do that. But we also have projects and and things that we do to reach out to people so that they can meet grace. And so we step out and do some things sometimes that nobody else is willing to do. You know, we do an event here the first Saturday of every month. It's called Dream Fest. And it's where people who are less fortunate in our community, maybe, you know, they've lost their job, their family's having a struggle and a hard time, and, you know, they need some groceries and some food. 
Here at this campus, many people serve the first Saturday of every month, and, and we generously give out groceries and help supply groceries for those families who come in here. And the reason we do that is to help them with their humanitarian need. That's really important because I don't believe anyone in our culture should go around hungry. And so it's a great thing to do that, but it's a deeper reason we do it. We don't just give food to just help with the humanitarian need, though that's a very important thing. We give the food from the generous heart of God so that they may be positioned with their faith to trust the grace gift, his name is Jesus, and begin to understand that there's a God that wants to touch them right where they are and begin to really change something in the inside so that they can be the champion that God has created for them to do. And it's an amazing, amazing thing. We, we do that. And another thing that we do that's on the other end of that spectrum that a lot of us are not aware of, and this, and this one really takes risk is we're actually acquiring a world-class conference center, and we've been doing that for about two years now. And we're stepping out. A lot of people say, why in the world would a church want to run a conference center? And from a human point of view, I'm like, dude, I don't want no part of that. I am happy being right here doing what I do every single weekend. And by the way, they don't teach you how to run conference centers in seminaries. So why, I mean, can't church just be the church and do those singings and, you know, and, and do the preaching? And that's, that's what church is. No, church is a people that, that really steps out and meets people where they are to begin to help them get to where God says they can be. But there's a people group in our culture. That's, an hard, that's a hard-to-reach people group. And Jesus spoke about them in Matthew chapter 19. And though we are commissioned and asked by God to reach out to those who are poor and hurting, maybe create a place for their faith to intersect with God's grace gift so that they can respond to the good news and begin to move forward and be the champion that God created them to be, they're sort of a hard-to-reach people group because they're not hungry. They got money. They've got things, and a lot of times they have more than I personally have. And can I tell you something? It's one thing to reach down and help someone with your faith. It's a whole nother level to reach up with your faith and help someone who has physically more than you do. And see, there's an image that the church has a lot of times, the people of God have, that the person that, that has stuff is okay, and so they're forgotten in our culture. And what happens is Jesus, he spoke to this in Matthew chapter 19. The Bible says he, his life intersected a man that the Bible calls a rich young ruler who was a very good man. The Bible says he kept the commandments. And he asked Jesus, how do I inherit the kingdom of God one day? And he says, I've kept all the commandments. What else must I do? And Jesus says, well, can you sell your stuff and come and follow me? Basically, so you can learn who you are and become who I've created you to be. Jesus don't have a problem with stuff. But he wants us to understand who he is in the midst of our stuff. And so... He invites the man to do that. The man couldn't do it. And the Bible says he dropped his head, turned away from Jesus. And Jesus turned to his followers, his students that day, and said something amazing. He says, it's very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And I think as I've kind of studied that passage and looked at that passage, really Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he was trying to encourage them to understand positionally this guy doesn't have what we would consider physical or monetary needs. And so he may never turn his heart uh, to me. And most people who have less than he has looks at the outward appearance but never considers the inward appearance. And see, we got to be really careful because apart from God, no matter if you have or have not, if your faith doesn't intersect with God's grace gift, 
You'll never become the champion that God has created you to be, and you'll never inherit eternal life. And what happens a lot of times is we reach down to people who physically don't have as much as we do, and we don't use our faith to reach up to people who have more than we do. Because it's a very difficult thing to do, to reach up and serve instead of reaching down to serve. And we tend to measure whether people are successful in life based on what they have in life, don't we? However, Jesus says, if you have not accepted the grace gift of who he is, that you know what, apart from that, you will never inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that burdens my heart. Because I think the church sometimes has forgotten that group of people. So why do we have a world-class conference center? Well, it's an amazing facility that has the ability to reach out to leadership, do things in such a hospitable way. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, because of God's kindness, because of God's hospitality, people turn away from their sin, turn their heart towards God, and basically become who God has created them to be. So could it be that the conference center is a vehicle to reach into that particular group of people's heart, the hard-to-reach people group, that it's very difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of God by us being people of God, serving with the heart of God in such an excellent and audacious and a, a, a heart of seeing them meet the one who can change their forever. Could it be that that conference center is a vehicle to do that? Because Jesus said something else amazing in that passage in Matthew. He goes on and he teaches it's very difficult for these people to enter the kingdom of God basically they're forgotten and it's hard for them to turn away from their stuff he says but with god in that same passage all things are possible do you really believe that with god and that faith that you have in that grace gift that all things are possible. That CEO who sits at the top of the ladder, you know what, that's hurting on the inside. Do you really believe with the audacious spirit of God that lives in you and the things that you don't have in this world that you can show God's hospitality and his kindness and his amazing authority in your life and stand in the gap for God with your faith to help that guy step out so that guy can step into the kingdom and become, or that gal, and become who God God has created them to be a son and a daughter of the king is a conference center ridiculous is it stepping out is it not normal for a church absolutely but those who believe by faith and can begin to see and walk by faith begin to see God show up in a powerful way in people's life that will forever change a community and so I'm inviting you what do you need to step out and do how do you need to think different about sharing this gospel of grace with people? Man, maybe for you at work, it's you just being kind to that. I lost my word. I, I want to say bitty, but that's not a good word to use in church. To that bitty at church, that's all I got right now. So anyway, maybe you should be kind to her. And show her God's grace. Sir, sir, maybe for you, it's, you know, just to, um, to put on the hat of listening to someone so that you can express the grace gift that's in you so that they can begin to experience this same Jesus. I mean, it looks different for us all, but I do believe when we're willing to step out and do what nobody else will do and present Jesus in a fresh way that actually people their faith can intersect with God's grace. You know that's why God put on skin, don't you? It's a fresh way. It was newness. As a matter of fact, Jesus was God in the flesh. And as he stood in front of religious people who were caught in systems and structure, and they thought God was going to show up a certain way, Jesus is talking to them. He's standing right in front of them. He is God in the flesh. He's talking to them, and, and they don't recognize him. And you know what he tells them? He says, and it's something they would understand in this culture. He says, you can't put new wine in an old wine skin. And that's what you're trying to do, he tells the people. He says, because if you try to put me, I'm new wine, I'm the freshness of God in the flesh, standing right before me, and 
right before you, and you're trying to put me in an old wineskin. If you put fermented new wine in an old dried out wineskin, it'll burst and, and the wine will be lost. And he's saying, what he's saying in that context is, I'm new wine. It's a new day. I'm doing something different that nobody expected. Don't try to put me in that box because if you try to put me in that box, I'm going to be missed in your culture. Isn't that amazing? But we, we still do that today on the other side of the cross. We have all these stories of Jesus, and we don't use the innovation and the mindset that God gives us to position faith so grace can be caught by those around us. And I do believe that those that step out, you know what, people are changed, and those people can help eventually change a community. It's where... It's where grace and faith connect that the person becomes salvaged, saved, rescued. The Spirit of God is placed in them, and then they start becoming that masterpiece that God has designed them for. Do you know what you're designed for? See, I think a lot of people sit here every single weekend, and they don't know what they're designed for. And I don't know what your particular task is, but I do know what the overall vision is for your life is. And it's as a Christ follower to participate with the gifts, the talents, and the resources that God has deposited in you and begin to leverage that in such a way that other people can put their faith in Jesus. It, not necessarily become a preacher like me, but what has God put in you for you to leverage that, to step out with, and begin to make an audacious difference in your community. These guys stepped out on faith, were willing to do things that nobody else was willing to do, not to just be cool, but so that people can connect. See, we don't do things just to be cool. We do things so that people can connect. A lot of people say, well, do you need these cool lights to have church? And the answer to that is absolutely not. We could cut them all off. But the cool lights do connect. <laughs> a lot of people to the gift of grace so that they can move forward with what God has created them to be. A light will never change anybody's life, but a light is a vehicle to get people to position so that they can have their life changed by Jesus. See how it works? And so, man, we've got to be creative like that. You know, God, God's people should be the most creative people on planet Earth. You're a creative genius. The question is, are you using that creative genius that is in you, to partner with God's people to transform a community. It, it can be done no matter what you do, whether you're a CEO of a plant, you know what, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or whatever else. The second thing I wrote down about this passage of Scripture, and I'm, I'm hoping we look at this passage with a fresh, a fresh view because, you know, the amazing thing in the story is not that the man got his legs healed. The amazing thing in the story, if you pay close attention, is the man's sin was forgiven by Jesus. And Jesus used the outward healing of his legs to communicate a message to non-believers. And many people think the man was brought there to have his legs healed, but the man was brought there so grace could connect with his faith and he could become the champion that God has created him to be. And his friends knew that. They didn't bring him there just to have his legs healed. They brought him there so he could put his faith in Jesus. The Bible says there was a huge crowd there. They couldn't get in. So what they did, they dug a hole through the roof. So that's the second thing our faith must do in order to really, really begin to transform lives is dig in. Everybody say dig in. They got to dig in. And I do believe that these guys had read their Bible. I, you know, because the amazing thing is, is they dug a hole through the roof to get to Jesus. Nobody would let them in. All the people had it all blocked up. And they're like, dude, we got to get this guy to a place where his faith can intersect with Jesus, where it can intersect with the grace gift so that his sins are forgiven. That was their mission. It was their heartbeat. It's one thing to be outwardly healed. It's a whole nother level for God to inwardly make you come alive by forgiving your sins so you can have an eternal connectivity to him and become who he has created you to be. 
So they dug in. You know, and again, I think they read their Bible. They didn't have the stories of the New Testament that we have now, but they did have what the prophets had written in the Old Testament. And there's an amazing story about digging in in the book of 2 Kings chapter 3. And there were three famous kings that were fighting against another group of people. And you know what? They were, they were getting wore out by this group of people, and they needed God, the genie, to do something about their problem. See, see, that's what a lot of people want, God, genie, genie God. Show up and do something about my problem. And so they were thirsty. The Bible says that the people were dying of thirst. They're animals. They, they had herds of animals. Their animals were thirsty. They were in a really dry valley. And they, they, they said, there's a guy, his name's Elijah, and he's a spokesperson for God. Maybe we need to meet with him, and he can tell us what we need to do in order for God to supply water for us, our families, and, and our animals. And so they went to meet with Elijah, the spokesperson for God. And Elijah understood that they kind of just wanted their, their challenge fix, but they didn't necessarily know that their heart was connected with God. And, and he kind of gives them some resistance, and he talks to the kings, not in a dishonorable way, but in a way with, with God's authority to basically say, you know what, God would love to, to put rain in in your life and in your valley so you don't have to be thirsty anymore, but God's bigger desire is for you to understand where that rain comes from and you trust him in this. And so Elijah could have just said, okay, God, genie, fill up the valley. And that's not what God wanted to do. See, his faith, their faith needed to be activated so they could understand the gift was from God. And so this is what Elijah told him to do. God's going to send the rain. They didn't see the rain. He says, God's going to fill this valley up and you won't be thirsty. Imagine if there was no water and your animals are not going to be thirsty. There is, going to, there is going to be water, but here's what you must do. Activate your faith and dig in. He says, you must pick up some shovels and begin to dig trenches in this valley so when God sends the rain that you don't see yet and you're saying that you're going to believe in God and you're going to trust that he's the one that sends the rain. He says, look here, I need you to respond by faith. And here's what I need you to do. Pick up some shovels and begin to dig ditches. So they're in the hot sun digging ditches and there is no rain. Zero. But Elijah encourages them to dig ditches. And you know what happens? It's because their faith was activated and they believed what the spokesperson of God said and began to put that to work. The Bible says God lavished rain and filled all those trenches and there was way more than enough water for the entire group of people uh, to drink. See, see, they dug in with their faith. You know, the Bible says in James that faith without works is dead. Wow. It's not that you work for your salvation. Matter of fact, the Bible makes it crystal clear in that passage I just read a few minutes ago in Ephesians that you don't work for your salvation. It's a gift from God. But you respond by faith, and that means you know what? You step towards it as, 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 as the gift is as if. And that's how life operates. You pick up a shovel and you dig in. You believe God. You believe that God will do what he says he will do, and you dig in and you step towards that, and, and, and you begin to see God do amazing, amazing things. But can I tell you something? The hardest place to dig in is when you can't see the rain. But that kind of faith changes communities. Because when you're willing to dig in and believe God, over the circumstances, and by the way, the circumstances are real for all of us, but they're not final. If we believe God over the circumstances and dig in, then what happens is that faith becomes contagious and begins to actually uh, build strength in us and influence others. The Bible calls it perseverance. Isn't that amazing? But if God doesn't show up with his candy tree in the morning, then a lot of us just snap and quit. And can I tell you something? That faith is not contagious. But the faith that stays the course and believes God and digs in and believes that God's going to do what he says he's going to do and going to forgive sins and make people whole, then when we stay the course and we do what God says to do, then that has the ability to transfer, strengthen me, and influence a community. I can tell you this. 
every single time I see a person respond to God's grace gift, my faith is strengthened. And I just want to go ahead and just be perfectly honest with you that, you know what? Sometimes I grow weary and I have to persevere. If, if things aren't moving forward, I'm like, dude, what is it? And God says, dig some ditches. Dig some ditches. Just stay the course. Keep digging ditches, and I'm going to send the rain. And I am learning that God, you know what? The amazing thing is he throws a perfect pass every single time, but there's this thing called hang time to allow me to get to the spot to receive what I need to receive. And if I stop running the pass pattern while the ball is in the air, I miss what God wants to do. It is hard to run and persevere when you cannot see. But can I tell you something? When you do and your faith meets grace, you will become a champion and begin to influence in ways you never dreamed you would influence. And every time God does what he says he will do, you are strengthened in the process. You know, I have this rock here. And on it, it says 444. Isn't that an amazing date? 040404. That's April 4th, 2004. Ten years ago this weekend. And, you know, on this rock is, is some words scribbled on it. And these words were scribbled on this rock as we sit in our living room and begin to dream about starting this thing called Barefoot Church approximately 10 years ago. We're about nine years old. We launched a year later, but we began to dream in our living room, and some people got in our living room. We began to share this message of grace and God's good news, and my neighbor across the street signed this rock and wrote 444, Christ was fully accepted in my mind, my soul, and my body. Jesus is the king of my life. I received the grace gift, and the first person to ever basically for their faith to intersect God's grace in this thing called Barefoot Church happened 10 years ago this weekend, sign PH, which means Phyllis Fessman. She was at the last service today. But you know what? You know why I keep this rock? It stays in my office. And this was the first person in our living room, but there's been thousands since then. And as I look at this rock, I'm reminded to persevere when I can't see the light and I can't see anymore because what God did for one, he did for thousands and he's going to do for tens of thousands. <clears throat> so so what, is your, what is your rock? Because that will help you persevere. What, what do you remember that God has done? That's why Israelites stack stones on the side of the river. You got to look back and remember what God has done. That strengthens you to move forward. But I can tell you something as the preacher, the great preacher in America, T.J. Jake says, at every level is another devil. And the truth of what that means is if you don't remember and stay faithful to what God's faithful about. And it's about helping people's faith intersect with God's grace. And, and it gets harder and more difficult, and you can give up. But if you will persevere and be about God's mission and dig in, and that's what your heart is about, because it is what God's heart is about, is reaching people that don't know who he is with the good news. And if you will cling to those faithful moments, it it will help you persevere when the valley is dry. Dig in. Believe. Man, we announced two years ago that we're going to build a campus across the waterway. A, a big facility over there. This is an amazing facility. We fill it up numerous times and do various things, but there's some other things that God wants to do through our facilities in our city. And, and man, at that particular time, I'm like, this is going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> and 
And I invited the congregation to dig in because there's more people to reach. Dig in. Let's dig in. Let's dig in. People are like, dude, I don't want to dig that deep. <laughs> and they bowed out. And I'm just being transparent. I do believe that God's grace is for this community and for every person whose faith has not intersected with that grace will take doing more than we do currently today. But what happens is we begin to say, well, God's grace is sufficient for me, but everybody else can spend eternity apart from God. And the God in me can't stop challenging you to dig in. And do we need another brick building or whatever else it is? Absolutely not. But will those kind of things begin to help other people engage and reach a culture and a city? Because God's people, God's church showed up in an audacious, in an excellent way to reach out to a community in ways that nobody else would reach out. And people flood into the kingdom of God. Can that happen? Absolutely. And I believe it with all of my heart. And so God says, stay the course. If they bow out, they bow out. Out, but I'm inviting you into the game. I'm inviting you on the journey. God wants to do more than he's currently doing in this moment, at this time, and in this place. He wants to use us to impact the world. I'm inviting you to dig in. It's amazing. It's dry, but the rain's coming. Believe with all of your heart. See what God is going to do. And so, man, these guys had faith to dig in. I got one more point, and then, you know what, I'll let you go home, eat lunch, and invite your friends to church for Easter weekend. But the last one is this. I want to say this before I get to the last point. The reason I stand on this stage today is because someone persevered with their faith. And everybody that stood around the table with this person says, you know what? You should not stay with him. That's my wife sitting down here on the front row. This, we've been married now for 20 years. This is back, you know, 17, 18 years ago. And basically they said, you know, you, you should walk away from him because he don't deserve somebody like you. You know, she is faultless. Just kidding. <laughs> and, you know, Advice from the crowd was walk away from him. But she went to God and the grace that lived inside of her. And she, she began to ask God what would he have for her to do. And basically, he spoke to her heart. She, he, she didn't know he was saying this, but he was saying dig in. Persevere. Believe that I, through you, can touch this, this person's heart and change there forever. And can I tell you something? She chose to persevere and believe God over the voice of the crowd. She dug in. She stuck with me. I saw God in her. Jesus became the king of my life. My faith intersected with God's grace. And can I tell you something? Because of that one little moment of perseverance in her life has paid thousands and thousands of dividends to the kingdom because she persevered in her marriage and her husband was salvaged by God. A gift was deposited into him for him to speak in such a way that actually thousands of people respond to the good news. And can I tell you, because of one lady's perseverance <laughs> and digging in, she began to really <laughs> change the community. And she was just a little bitty country girl living in a Georgia community at that time. She didn't know she was moving to the beach with the sand in her toes and the margaritas in the thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> We're half Baptists. Last point, a faith that transforms a community steps out, digs in, and most of all, 
demonstrates. Demonstrates that God lives on the inside. I know a lot of you got texts because I got a bunch of them too. God is not dead. <laughs> From the movie, you know what I'm saying? I think there's something at the end of the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet. They said, text all your friends, God is not dead. And so people put me on group text and say, God is not dead. And so all their friends respond to them about their personal issues on a group text. And God is not dead. And how's your mama doing? You know, and I'm like, dude, I am tired of my phone going off at 1030 at night. So if you group text me that God is not dead, please don't do that. Just single text me and that'll be okay. I understand God is not dead. I don't know. I just wanted to share that with you. But anyway, so anybody else get those texts yet? Okay, just curious. All right. So it is not polite, it is not texting etiquette <laughs> to put people in group text at 10 p.m. at night <laughs> where they're and have a conversation about something totally obsolete from the group text. It is not, it's not texting etiquette, I just want to be clear, all right? So a faith that works and connects a community to Jesus demonstrates by walking with Jesus. The amazing thing is, is remember, this guy, you know what, his friends brought him to Jesus so that he could, his faith could intersect the grace gift. Jesus does exactly what Jesus can only do. Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Now remember, there's a whole crowd of people that were religious scholars, had studied the scriptures, amazing things, and they look at the God in the flesh in front of them and say, only God has the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus says, well, I know that you understand that, but you don't understand who's in front of you. So let me help you out. He says, I have the authority to make this man whole and forgive his sin. And is it easier to say, for your sins are forgiven or stand up and pick up your mat and walk. And so I've already done the internal change on his life. Now externally, he's going to demonstrate that he is going to walk with me, that he surrendered his life uh, to me. And so I tell him to stand up and walk in front of you. And the Bible says the onlookers were astonished. This is what I want to share with you. When you demonstrate and walk with Jesus, and go where Jesus tells you to walk. The onlookers are astonished. The Bible says that, you know what, the inward thing that God does in us produces something externally. Now, you can have artificial, external, what we would call fruit. It's hard to identify sometimes and until you bite it. It's not very sweet, okay? It's fake. However, you know what Jesus says, if he does a work in you and you begin to walk with him, fruit is produced out of you and that fruit is contagious so other people can taste God's goodness and God's grace. And so, man, I just want to encourage you to demonstrate who God is externally about what God has done internally. It doesn't mean walking around with the plastic fake Christian smile on all the time, but it does mean that, you know what, something should be being produced out of you that other people begin to see and is attracted to. You are to have attractive, very juicy, tasty fruit in your life. You know what that fruit is? The Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I know that I am not perfect in that, okay? But however, I have produced a fruit. My fruit's got little worms in it, all right? <laughs> and if you look closely at, for you fruit inspectors, if you look closely at the fruit, though, it is doing what God says it will do. And it is producing something. My peaches may be a little small, Okay, but I can tell you something, you know, the truth is it's being shoved out of me by my relationship with God and, and it begins to really, um, that, that, that faith begins to touch people's life and they stand astonished because in the flesh, when you look at me, I have no business whatsoever underneath all of God's creation to be up here doing this. However, somehow, some way, God pushes something out of me that begins to transform and connect with people's heart so that they can put their faith in God's grace gift. God told that man to stand up and walk. And when that man began to walk where Jesus said walk, it was contagious. And the whole community was like, wow, 
man, I'm inviting you to be a wow Christian. Not like the flash in the pan, dude. I'm talking about like walk, step out, dig in, demonstrate, be, be who God has created you to be. And then I want to really end today with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, because it's who God says that you are if you've believed in a resurrected Jesus. And if you have not believed in a resurrected Jesus, once you do believe, this is who you will become. And I want you to understand the whole reason we are here is, is because of, of this verse, and we believe that God's heart is for all a people. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are God's masterpiece. We're his champion. If you have put your faith in God's grace gift and his name is Jesus, the finished work of Jesus on the cross, the Bible says you're a masterpiece. And it says he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And so when faith and grace intersect, we become a masterpiece in God's hands so we can take that grace gift that we have received and do the amazing things, score touchdowns, put points on the board, attract other people to the team so that they can become who God has created them to be. And so, man, I'm just inviting you to be the masterpiece, be the champion, be the amazing person that God has created you anew in Christ Jesus to be. Because it's so much more than a church service. It is who we are every day of our life. And I am believing God to bring transformation. Literally, I won't go as big in my mind as my mind says we can go. But I'll just start with this. In this community, I see by faith thousands of people from every race, every gender, every age group, every social economic class in multiple services because their faith has intersected God's grace. And we rise up and become the people of God in a community, a people in a people that really influences a people not to be religious, but to move back to who God has said that they can be in Christ Jesus, to receive the forgiveness of their sins learn from the amazing creator and live out the championship life that God calls them to live. Is that the kind of people you want to be? If it is, put your hands together today. I'm going to pray for you. And you know, the thing is, I can't have faith for you and you can't have faith for me, but we can influence each other with our faith and those around us. And it's up to us to personally put our faith in Jesus. And you know, I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna to give today and we have an opportunity for people to do that in a powerful way on Easter weekend. So I encourage you, exercise your faith, step out, dig in, demonstrate that, invite, 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 pip the peep, all that good stuff that we're doing, pip the peep.com, pimp the peep.com uh, is a website you can go to to participate in an invite. There's invite cards out there. There's ways for you to serve at Easter services out front. Stop off at those tables, tell them you wanna serve at a service. Let them know that today. It would be awesome. Let me pray for us. God, you're an amazing, amazing God. And God, we really are encouraged today to live out our faith the way you intend for us to live. God, thank you for a fresh look at Mark chapter 2 today and this man's story. I pray that we would learn principles out of this story. Live that out right here. Easter, as Easter is upon us, may we be the kind of people that are faith carriers to our community that really attracts people to who Jesus is so that their, their faith can intersect with God's grace and they can become the champions that God has created them to be. God, I pray that, you know what, that every person here who has received that gift, that God, they be encouraged today. They become a part of the local fellowship. They become who God has created them to be. Live that out and continually be strengthened and inspiring the community around them. God, you're an amazing God. And God, we pray for our Easter services. We pray for our community. We pray for our community of faith. We pray for our family, Barefoot Church, that God, you would rise us up to be something greater than we are by ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Put your hands together one more time.